you know, saying that things like dinosaur fossils were uh, a tool of Satan or whatever. I mean, just... Uh, well, I was you know, brought up to believe that a college professor was the smartest person on earth. Right. Yeah. And I believed that for a while, but I... Professors <laughs> I and doctors and, and scientists and... They um, may know a lot about one subject, but... Yeah, and we can even go back to first grade, kindergarten, first grade, with our parents telling us to listen to your teachers now. They know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, it, right from the right, right out of the chute, we're, we're giving us these false ideas and false information about how we were made. Well, and we're not we're not taught how to think. We're, no. You know, kids are taught what to think. You know, like you Who were taught in college. <laughs> well, Mary Lou, thanks for calling. Unless you have another question or a point, no, you'd like. No, thank to you very much. Thank Good you, night. Mary Lou. Bye. Good night. And and I would just to finish that thought. Sure. I, you know, uh, I think we would all agree. You know, we we can't we can't force any viewers or anybody uh, to become Christians. We can't argue them into the kingdom. Um, but what we are here to do, the name of your program is Truth Seekers, is to stand up for the truth. And when it, you know the evolutionary scientists or whoever it is with an anti-God agenda. Um, when they come along and they want to, they want free access to our children or to the culture. Um, well, they have a right to speak, but we have a right to answer them and to say, "Hang on a minute, uh, you know, kids, students, society, think for yourselves," and you know, and challenge them, you know, and ask ask good questions. And and it turns out that you know, as guys like Roger Oakland and and the thousands of creation scientists out there demonstrate, there there are good answers. If people want answers, if answers to uh, you know help them uh, be comfortable with the science, you know, with the Bible and everything, there there are lots of great answers. You so. know, and and especially Dave, we're, we're supposed to be tolerant and diverse. So why can't the school systems be tolerant and diverse in, let's just teach science and let the kid decide? Right, exactly. On, on, on what the evidence shows him. Right, they're not even allowed. And that, this film that we always like to talk about, I think it's going to be out in April, Ben Stein's film, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, just talking about how people who just hold different viewpoints and they have all the scientific evidence aren't even allowed to criticize Darwinian teaching. <laughs> It's such censorship, and it's such, as Ben Stein would say, un-American, uh, unjust, and it just shows that it's, it's driven by a certain group of people. And that movie will be out in April, and it gets into a lot of that. Why don't you finish up what you're going to say, and then we'll show a next section of film is about six minutes long. Yeah, well, I can say a lot of things. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying can I to say something real, real quick. No, go ahead. Dave. You know, they're they're terrified of what of of the conclusions the students are going to come to if they're allowed to come to their own conclusions. So again, they're taught what to think, they're not allowed to think for themselves, and they're not taught how to think. Yeah, and just a, a simple example would be, let's look at the lung of a bird. That lung is specifically designed for it to live and breathe just the way it is. You, you change the mechanism of that lung one iota through the evolving process or the irreducible complexity, it's distinct. It can't breathe, it can't live. It needs that lung just the way it is. You know, why you, when you bring that up, most evolutionists say that it's lizards that turned into birds. And the utter <clears throat> impossibility of all of that. Well, gradually. their whole breathing systems are yeah. completely different. Michael Denton, do I have his name correct? Mm -hmm. I think I do. From both Australia and New Zealand, he's lived and taught in both, I think, um, is an evolutionist. But he talks about this. He's written a book on this called, I think, The Crisis of Evolution. And he just shows, as an evolutionist, how he came to see that there's no way. Uh, there, it's not in the fossil record. It's not. Nothing has changed, uh, you know, thousands of transitions. You'd have to have such incredible transitions, and, and those creatures wouldn't be able to live as they transmorph from one lizard into a bird. Uh, the lung is a big problem, the feathers from, from uh, scales, it's, it's crazy. Anyhow, we've got a six-minute second, six-minute segment of film, and then we'll be back to talk with you folks again. So stick with us. I think you'll like the six minutes that we're going to show. Emmanuel Reddy proved to the world that you can't get life from non-life spontaneously. At that time, people believed that uh, if you put garbage outdoors, it would eventually turn into maggots and flies and rats. And so he placed garbage outdoors, covered it over with a screen, 
And of course the flies were not able to get to the garbage or the rats and he verified it's not possible for non-life to become life. Well, the evolutionary assumption is that it did happen a long time ago in the distant, unobservable past. The idea that non-living materials can assemble to become life has been accepted by the intellectual community that support evolution. And of course, one of the experiments that's commonly referred to is the Stanley Miller experiment that goes back to the 1950s. And many people today still argue, well, you know, it's possible in the laboratory, given the right conditions, to produce building blocks of life. And this is what Miller did. He had an apparatus which included boiling water. He created an oxygen-free environment. Methane was added, hydrogen was added, ammonium hydroxide, and then a 50,000 volt spark. There was a cooling chamber and a trap. And yes, he was able to produce some building blocks. Amino acids, glycine, alanine, aspartic, and glutamic acid. There were non-biological amino acids. Urea, organic acids, formic, acetic, succinic, and lactic. But there were problems. You see, this was an oxygen-free environment. And that would have been totally unrealistic in the original Earth if life originated from non-life. And of course, there would be no trap present when life was formed there was a production of these toxic chemicals which would have destroyed any of these building blocks that supposedly were created spontaneously and left-handed amino acids are the only ones that are required for life when in this particular situation both left-handed and right-handed amino acids were produced and today most scientists don't refer to Miller's experiment as verification of the proof that non-life can become life. For example, Hubert Yockey, in a paper called A Calculation of the Probability of Spontaneous Biogenesis by Information Theory, from the Journal of Theoretical Biology, volume 67, page 396, stated the following. The warm little pond scenario was invented ad hoc to serve as a materialistic reductionist explanation of the origin of life. It is unsupported by any other evidence, and it will remain ad hoc until such evidence is found. One must conclude that, contrary to the established and current wisdom, a scenario describing the genesis of life on Earth by chance and natural causes, which can be accepted on the basis of fact and not faith, has not yet been written. It couldn't be clear. In other words, what Yaki is saying, it has never been observed that non-living materials can spontaneously formulate life. Nevertheless, we continue to see this propaganda proclaimed. For example, the National Geographic, March 1998, page 60. There is an article about Stanley Miller's experiment, father of prebiotic chemistry. And this statement, approximating conditions on the early Earth in a 1952 experiment, Stanley Miller, now at the University of California at San Diego, produced amino acids. Once you get the equipment together, it's very simple, he says. Well, what are they talking about? A building block, they're talking about an amino acid, which is a component of a protein. Now, scientists have attempted to look at the possibility of proteins formulating spontaneously from amino acids at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And through statistical analysis, they came to the conclusion that the possibility of a protein molecule being formulated by chance would be one over 10 followed by 56 zeros. Now, that's an extremely small possibility. How small? Well, this is the analogy which they gave. They said it would be like walking down the street one day and seeing a lottery ticket on the sidewalk, picking up the lottery ticket and discovering that you had won the lottery for that week. But you would also have to do it the second week in a row. And the third week in a row, you would also have to find a lottery ticket and the winning one the fourth week in a row, the fifth week in a row, 
In fact, every week in a row, continuously for 1,000 years. 